Welcome to Hearth of Hymonia. My name is Kate, and today is the first day of Mercury Retrograde. If you are watching this on Friday, September 9th, 2022, that means that something crazy happened and the video made it up despite the fact that it's the first day of Mercury Retrograde. All right, I'm kind of kidding. Because today is the first day of Mercury retrograde, I wanted to talk about the Roman god Mercury and some of his associations in mythology as well as astrology, both ancient and modern. So for those of you who are not familiar with Mercury retrograde, it is a time in the year, it happens three, maybe four times each year, when the planet Mercury appears to be traveling backwards from its usual course around the solar system and, you know, in our perception around the Earth. Now, astronomically speaking, Mercury retrograde is an optical illusion that's caused by the speed that Mercury travels around the Sun at versus the speed that the Earth travels at. I don't know how best to explain it, but it is not moving backwards around the sky. It just appears that way because of our position relative to Mercury and relative to the Sun, if that makes sense. So that's what causes Mercury retrograde. In astrological terms, the planet Mercury governs over different aspects of your life, and so when it goes retrograde, those areas of your life may be affected. Now, all planets have retrograde phases, but Mercury's occurs most often, which is why it's talked about more than others. There's a bit of internet panic around Mercury retrograde, generally speaking, because a lot of times the things that Mercury governs tend to or can seem to go haywire during a retrograde phase. In my estimation, it's blown way out of proportion. I think that when you have platforms like Twitter and TikTok where everything is supposed to be super, super short form, you don't get the full story. So there's a lot of panic around Mercury retrograde. And I, I don't think that it's that big a deal, but I did want to make a video about not only Mercury retrograde, but Mercury as a planet in ancient and modern astrology. And of course, the god Mercury himself and how he sort of fits into the religious and mythological landscape of Rome, his Greek counterpart Hermes, and then some of the ancient astrology and modern astrology. So it's kind of a lot to go through uh, and let's just get started. Now, this is not a video about Hermes per se. I'm going to link in the description an excellent video that's all about Hermes by Fortress of Lug, which is a great YouTube channel. Um, I highly recommend their work. They do a very long, it's like over two hours, discussion of Hermes through all of his mythological stories and his functions and his cult worship and comparing him to other cultures and their gods who have similar associations. It's an excellent video, so I will recommend that to you as the more in-depth version of my discussion of Hermes. I'm basically only going to cover the aspects of Hermes that are directly related to today's topic, which are the associations that Hermes has which carry over into Mercury both as a god and as a planet in ancient and modern astrology. Hermes is usually described as the son of Zeus and Maya. Maya is one of the Pleiades, so if you're deep into modern astrology, you may be familiar with that group. And Hermes appears to have originally been kind of like a rustic pastoral god, associated very closely with a lot of animals, cattle, things like that, eventually adopting some other characteristics that I'm gonna go into in just a sec. Now, some accounts equate Hermes with Pan, who is the sort of like poster child for rustic gods in Greece, I guess you could say. And in other accounts, Hermes is Pan's father, but either way they are connected in some way, so Hermes has that association with the sort of wild lands, very much like an earthy kind of nature god, who is associated with 
things related to pastoral living, like being a shepherd, um, a herdsman, uh, dealing with cattle, playing musical instruments um, was a big thing, you know, in the countryside and Pan in particular. Hermes has so much mythology that it would take us way far out of our way to go through it all. What I'm going to do is just give you a, a sort of a laundry list of characterizations of Hermes that are related to our topic. Now the aspect of Hermes that is probably the most famous is that he is the messenger god. He's depicted wearing winged sandals or sometimes a you know winged helmet. He carries a staff that's two snakes on it. You, you know who I'm talking about. If you've seen Disney's Hercules, you know what I'm talking about. He is the messenger who brings news to and from uh, between gods and also between the gods and other realms like the human world, the underworld. Hermes is the one who sort of travels around delivering these messages. And a lot of times when Hermes appears in mythology, he's not the main character in a story, but he is sent by someone to deliver a message to someone else. Or there's a report that Hermes told me such and such. In the beginning of the Odyssey, for example, Zeus is complaining how Aegisthus and Clytemnestra murdered Agamemnon, even though Hermes went to warn Aegisthus that certain doom would come to him if he did this. And of course, certain doom does in fact come. So Hermes is sort of playing that role in most of his mythological appearances, although there are plenty of myths that are strictly speaking about him as well. When it comes to Hermes as a messenger god, I think the key word for Hermes is communication or dialogue. He is acting in most of his aspects as some kind of liaison between parties. That's sort of his role. So as the messenger, he's not the one coming up with these things, he's not the one deciding things, or in his own right kind of directing the action, but he does play a crucial role in the dissemination of information. So I think communication and dialogue are really good keywords for him, uh, just to keep in mind. Hermes is also associated with cattle. Um, as I said before, he stole the cattle of the sun god, that's like one of his main myths. There's like the Homeric hymn to Hermes describes this, it comes up, you know, in a few other places. He basically steals the cattle of the sun god and wreaks havoc through his sort of like childlike trickery. Trickster energy is another aspect of Hermes as well. But his connection to cattle interests me in particular because cattle was the main measure of your wealth and your sort of like personal net worth in the ancient world, especially if you were a farmer. Obviously for people living in urban centers, this was not the case, but just to give you an example of how this worked, the Latin word for money, generally speaking, is pecunia, which comes from the word pecus, which means a herd of cattle. So your wealth, your money, your pecunia is measured in cattle. And even after coins became popular, this was still a big deal. So Hermes' association with cattle is how we come to understand him to be a god of merchants. And just notably, I'm skipping ahead to Mercury a little bit here, but Mercury's name comes from the Latin word merx, which also has to do with currency and um, sort of like economics in general, and his name is related to our English words like commerce, mercantile, merchant, all of those things are related to the god Mercury. So you can already see the sort of financial thing. So we have communication, dialogue, we have economics, finance. Next, Hermes is a god of travel. This probably makes sense given how much time he spends on the road delivering messages and overseeing the exchange of goods. He's a god of the roads. So there are different gods that govern different aspects of the roads, like Trivia, the, the god of the triple crossroads. You know, Janus is the god of thresholds and boundaries, that kind of thing. Although Hermes also has that as well. He can also be a god of boundaries, but he's primarily the god of the journey along the way, we'll say. 
In ancient Greece, boundary markers were called herms. Sometimes they depicted the god himself, sometimes they depicted phallic imagery, which was sort of like a uh, protection slash fertility thing. Hermes also has a fertility aspect to him. But anyway, these herms give us the sort of association between Hermes and the road, which again makes sense with his other functions. And lastly, Hermes is a god of the underworld. This is not his main aspect, but it is one function that he serves. I've already mentioned that he delivers messages between not just the gods above and other gods above, the gods and humans on Earth, but also he delivers messages to and from the underworld. So he has the ability to go back and forth between all of these different realms. He also serves a very specific function, which is as psychopomp. Hermes is the guide for souls of the deceased to pass into the underworld. He guides them on that journey. This makes him part of the milieu of the chthonic deities, he's connected to magic. So to summarize Hermes, communication and dialogue, commerce and economics, traveling and underworld associations. And trickery. I, I want to keep trickery in there too. So that's basically it for Hermes. Mercury is very similar to Hermes and has pretty much the same exact associations and functions. He is a god of commerce, thievery and trickster kind of energy, like I said before, god of merchants, uh, especially merchants who have to travel. In Rome, Mercury is in charge of like eloquent speech. The Romans placed a lot of emphasis on one's ability to speak well. It was a very important aspect of Roman public life that you be able to deliver a speech well, that you be able to command a crowd, let's say, particularly in the political and legal spheres, but I think sort of generally speaking. So the fact that Mercury rules over that makes him pretty significant um, in terms of Rome's public life. Pretty much all of Mercury's major aspects have to do with communication of some kind. Like I said, you have obviously eloquence of speech that's like direct communication, but you also have the communication of economics, trading, you have to go back and forth, uh, travel, communicating between places, um, or, or communication between people who live far away. This is also his function as a messenger. And communication between realms, right, of the gods, the earthly human realm, and again, the underworld. When it comes to mythology, there aren't actually a lot of Roman stories that are specifically about Mercury. We have a ton of mythology about Hermes from the Greek side of things. I don't know necessarily that I would go so far as to say that the assumption was that everything written about Hermes applied to Mercury, but I think we can say that at least the Romans would have been aware of these stories and that would have been part of Mercury's sort of religious observance or um, the understanding of him as a god. Stories about Mercury himself are few and far between, but that doesn't mean that he was less important, right? He governed a lot of the major aspects of Roman life. A lot of times he shows up as like a minor character in myths about other people or gods. So for example, in book four of Virgil's Aeneid, the hero Aeneas is hanging out with Dido in Carthage and he's staying a little bit too long. He's not going on to his destiny to found a city in Italy. So the gods send Mercury down to remind him of his destiny. So even though Mercury is sort of a minor figure here, uh, he plays kind of a major role in turning the course of events because he convinces Aeneas that he needs to move on from Carthage and actually establish that city in Italy rather than spending the rest of his life in Carthage, which he sort of wanted to do. Um, that wasn't his destiny, that wasn't his plan, and if Mercury hadn't been sent down to sort of roust Aeneas, the Roman state would not exist if we're talking about the sort of mythological foundings. He plays this major role as sort of like a minor character in a lot of mythology. One story that he shows up in and actually does something in, um, other than just delivering messages, 
is in Ovid's Fasti, which I'm slowly starting to realize is becoming like one of the most important texts for this channel. Uh, so more on that many times in the future, I'm sure. But the Fasti, basically this is a sort of like religious calendar type poem, if we could summarize it. Ovid tells a story about how a nymph named Lara rats on Jupiter, who has once again been cheating on his wife Juno. This nymph tells Juno about it and Jupiter gets mad. So he banishes Lara to the underworld and he sends Mercury to guide her there um, so that she can be sort of like silenced. Uh, Ovid talks in the poem about how the underworld is fitting for her so that she can't use her voice to like meddle in other people's business. So as Mercury is leading her down there, he decides that he wants to sleep with her and he impregnates her and she gives birth to twins who are the Lares, related to her name, Lara, who become the gods of the household, among other things. That's one of those stories where Mercury, again, is not the main character, but he shows up and he does something that ultimately has a, a major consequence. And it's also interesting because a lot of Mercury slash Hermes mythology tends to be more lighthearted than this, or at the very least neutral, but here, Mercury is kind of like a villain. There is mention of the fact that because she's in the underworld, she can't appropriately speak and protest what he's doing. He, he's kind of the bad guy here, uh, which I thought was interesting because it doesn't usually shake out that way. You know, he steals the cattle of the sun, but, you know, everything sort of works out in the end. He does all these things that kind of end up working out and being okay, but then in this case it's sort of just like a bad thing that Mercury did. Lastly, I want to talk about a poem dedicated to Mercury that's written by Horace. Horace is a poet of the Augustan period. He grows up sort of rustic poor, living in the countryside. His father is a freedman. He lives this way until he's sort of like discovered or sponsored by Augustus's circle of literary patrons or patrons of the arts. Um, and then he ends up going on to become a professional poet, and he speaks at length in a lot of his works about his gratitude for this situation. Um, that's sort of his thing. Horace refers to himself as like Mercurialis, a devotee of Mercury, under special protection from Mercury, or Mercury's like his main patron god. So he writes this poem dedicated to him. Now, I am going to read my translation, but I've also posted this on my website if you want to reference it at any point in the future. I'll put the link for that in the description. Horace says, Mercury, eloquent grandson of Atlas, who skillfully shaped the savage customs of the early days of man with voice and with the graceful custom of the wrestling ring. I will sing about you, messenger of great Jupiter and the gods, and progenitor of the curved lyre, crafty enough to hide whatever you please in playful theft. Apollo laughed while he was trying to frighten you with a threatening voice when you were a boy, unless you returned the cattle taken away by your trickery without his arrow. And in fact, wealthy Priam, with you as his guide, left Ilium behind and escaped the notice of the boastful Atrides and Thessalian fires and camps hostile to Troy. You conduct pious souls to their happy resting places and coax the weightless crowd with your golden staff, pleasing to the gods above and those below. Okay, it's astrology time. And I will warn you that Hellenistic astrology is super complicated and I am not an expert in it. If you want to hear from an expert on Hellenistic astrology, I would recommend the work of Chris Brennan. He's the host of the Astrology Podcast, which is how I know him, but he also wrote the book, literally, on Hellenistic astrology. And even though I haven't read it yet, just based on the way that he speaks in his podcast, I can sort of blindly recommend the book to you because I'm sure it's very good and I'm like, I'm almost ready to get my hands on a copy. But astrology's so complicated that I'm like, no, today's not the day. But unfortunately for me, today is the day. So let's get into Mercury in Hellenistic astrology. The astrologer Claudius Ptolemy says that Mercury is dry and sort of like takes away moisture because it's really close to the sun. 
but it also provides moisture and humidity because it's so close to the moon a lot of the time. And this is one example, and there will be many, many more, of how Mercury can have somewhat contradictory associations. Uh, Mercury has this kind of unique ability to shift between one thing and the other. I'll go down the list of characteristics and you'll see that they are either opposing or he kind of like is in the middle of two opposing things. So it's kind of a long story, but Claudius Ptolemy divides the planets into two different categories, benefics and malefics, and these are based on the four humors. Mercury is neither. He sort of just brings out the characteristics of whatever planet he's near. So if he's near benefics, he's going to bring out more of those positive aspects. If he's near malefics, he's going to bring out more of the negative aspects. Claudius Ptolemy also assigns genders to the planets masculine and feminine, and yet Mercury is neither. He is in the middle. Mercury as a planet is sort of gender neutral and again brings out whatever qualities of the planets that he's near. Likewise, Claudius Ptolemy says some planets are day planets and some planets are night planets, and Mercury, you guessed it, is neither but somewhere in the middle and brings out the characteristics of whatever he's near. And just one more note about Mercury as a sort of like shapeshifter type changeable planet. Um, Mercury in ancient and modern astrology rules over the signs of Gemini and Virgo. These are both uh, what are called mutable planets, so they sort of are able to change, you know, and, and kind of adapt and they're ruled by Mercury, the sort of adaptable planet. Vettius Valens, who is another sort of second century Hellenistic astrologer, writes a very long list of characteristics of Mercury. Based on our discussion of Mercury as a god, we can sort of see how these aspects of the planet are related to the Mercury that we know from mythology. The planet Mercury rules over communication, trade, economics, travel, and so on. And where Mercury falls in your chart, which for, for those of you who are not astrologers, it means where wherever Mercury is situated in the sky at the time that you were born, it will have some kind of effect on those aspects of your life based on what it's near, what sign it's in, and so on. Betty's Valens also goes into detail about how Mercury can affect things when it's in conjunction with other planets. So I'll read to you, by the way, um, Claudius Ptolemy and Vettius Valens, I found translations of both of them for free online, so I will link those in the description below. I'm going to read to you from page 18 of the Vettius Valens translation that I am linking in the description. So that's where this is coming from. He says, Venus and Mercury are in harmony. They make men sociable and gracious, gregarious and hedonistic, paying attention to education and sensibility, receiving honors and gifts. For those of mediocre fortune, these stars bring about the receiving of goods, selling and exchanges, and they bring a base livelihood. These stars make men unsteady and fickle with respect to women, changeable in their agreements with them. You can probably guess Venus is a planet that very much has to do with your romantic life and I think your social life in general, um, among other things. And so already you see when Venus and Mercury get together, men can become sort of fickle in their relationship with women. So they can be changeable and kind of move around and not quite have a, a fixed way of being. So if Venus and Mercury are conjunct in your birth chart, you might not be that great at relationships because you're having kind of like wishy-washiness and communication troubles. Valens also talks about what happens when Mercury is in the ascendant position. Now I'm just giving little snippets here Vettius Valens' description of Mercury is super long and there's all sorts of like stuff that goes into it. Um, so I'm kind of just picking and choosing to give you a flavor of what the ancient astrology looked like. He says that when Mercury's in the ascendant, it brings fortune, but if it's conjunct with Saturn in the ascendant position, um, they might be hard of hearing. So you get everything from sort of general characteristics. It 
brings fortune, generally speaking, in this person's life. This person's gonna have a fairly decent life. But also, they may be very specifically hard of hearing. For Mercury in modern astrology, I'm just gonna once again recommend Chris Brennan. I'm gonna link a couple of podcast episodes that deal with Mercury and Mercury retrograde. Um, but I'll try to summarize some points here that are related to the discussion we've been having so far. So the bulk of modern astrology developed from Hellenistic astrology. Obviously, there are other influences that make it the sort of complex tapestry that it is today, but a lot of influences come from Hellenistic astrology. So it shouldn't really be surprising then that Mercury in modern astrology rules over communication, trade, travel, finances, etc, etc. The main difference that I see is Mercury the planet governs our technology. And at first it might feel a little bit random, it might feel like, oh, technology needed a planet to rule over it, so we'd, we'll just give it to Mercury. But if you think about it, our technology affects the aspects of our lives that are already governed by Mercury. Our communication, even just phone calls, like landline phones. That's a huge technological advancement, but it has to do specifically with communication. And that's to say nothing about social media and email, and even now especially more and more people are working remotely. It sort of makes sense that Mercury governs that aspect of our lives. Technology is also the main component of our travel nowadays. We don't really walk too many places, we drive, and we scan our mobile boarding passes, I mean, traffic lights. And then even in terms of finance, I mean, most banking is done online, not to mention the fact that we have cryptocurrency, which is like a new element into the global economic system. These things are all heavily reliant on technology, so it makes sense then that Mercury would rule over technology. Mercury retrograde in general, I mean, Mercury is, like I said, a changeable planet. It appears to change its direction three to four times per year. It has that kind of shifting energy. And because it goes retrograde so often, people report a change in those aspects of their lives that Mercury rules over. So this is why in sort of popular mainstream astrological discussions, there's such a big sort of overblown fear of Mercury retrograde because, you know, your phone is gonna break or your car is gonna crash or your flight's gonna get canceled or your ex is gonna come back into your life because you have weird relationshipy communication things happening. But I mean, Mercury goes retrograde multiple times per year. And again, I think it's a little overblown. It's much the same way that, you know, crystal witch talk or whatever the kids are calling it nowadays will say like, don't ever touch Moldavite. It's going to ruin your life. You can never, you know, get near it. It's going to destroy everything. But like, low key, it's a rock. <laughs> um, not to, not to diss crystal people. I am a crystal people. But I don't know, there's a lot of fear mongering that happens and I see that a lot with Mercury retrograde as well. So I think the key here, if you want to be prepared for Mercury retrograde is just to prepare yourself in those areas of your life. People will say, you know, don't ever sign a contract. It's like, well, just make sure that you're reading all the fine print. You know, people say, don't book a vacation. It's like, you can book a vacation, but before you leave the house, double check to make sure that you brought your passport and your toothbrush, you know? I wanted to end with some sort of like, ancient flavored advice for this upcoming Mercury retrograde. And again, I'm not an astrologer, so these are just some miscellaneous thoughts. This is not like a, a legit video about how to survive this Mercury retrograde, but here we go. I'd say the first thing, as with all Mercury retrogrades, is just to slow it down. Mercury is a fast-moving planet. Mercury the god moves very swiftly between worlds. He's always going somewhere. But when Mercury is retrograde, you kind of want to take a step back. You kind of want to just relax a little bit. Um, it's very much about going sort of inward and working on things or like laying the groundwork for things to come in the future. 
So that's the first bit of advice, not necessarily related to antiquity, but I wanted to throw that in there. So this Mercury retrograde in particular begins in Libra and goes back into Virgo and then when Mercury stations direct, meaning the retrograde is over, it goes back the other way. So normally planets go through each sign in a fixed order. So Virgo first and then Libra. But because we're entering into a retrograde, that means that Mercury is going to start in Libra, appear to go backwards into Virgo, and then start its course again and go from Virgo back to Libra. So this Mercury retrograde begins in the sign of Libra, which is represented by the scales. It's all about balance. It's all about not quite justice per se, but a, a sense of fairness and a sense of like finding a solution, very much like a mediating type sign. Libra is also ruled by Venus. Libra people in astrological terms are lovers of beauty, really into aesthetics, uh, very romantic in their own way. So when Mercury goes retrograde in Libra, which is ruled by Venus, you might have miscommunication, a sort of like negative spin on Mercury's normal aspect of positive communication, specifically when it comes to your relationships. When Mercury goes back into Virgo, it's entering into the sign that it governs. So it's probably a little bit happier, but Virgo is all about planning. And so you may find that plans fall through. You may find that your amazing organizational system gets disrupted. Something happens, some kind of like technical challenge happens. And then when Mercury stations direct, in Virgo, which it will at the end of the retrograde period, then those types of planning things become a little bit easier to deal with and then Mercury goes back towards Libra and your communication kind of sorts itself out. So this is just an example of how you can use some of these ancient astrological associations, which again are pretty much the same as modern ones, in order to interpret what this Mercury retrograde is supposed to bring. Now, I'm not really an astrologer. I'm like a casual astrologer. So please let me know in the comments what I got wrong and what you would add or, or strongly object to. That was just a, a little fun exercise, I thought, to try and tie all of these things together. You can see the connection between Mercury the god and Mercury the planet, um, both in antiquity and in the modern age, and how even though our world has changed, the modern additions to astrology are in line with ancient astrologers' observations. Mercury rules over technology because he is the god of communication and travel and money and all that good stuff. So that's basically all I have for you today. Uh, wishing you lots of rest during this Mercury retrograde period. Uh, if you liked this video, you can go ahead and let me know by leaving a thumbs up. Um, I really appreciate those. And if you want to see more videos that have to do with Greek and Roman religion and belief systems in general, magic in particular, uh, you can go ahead and subscribe. That really helps me a lot and it helps you be able to see all of my future videos. So thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate you and I will see you next time.